I guess I'll introduce Richard, I guess, people that don't know Richard, uh, Richard Davis, he's a third, fourth, third, I, I track. second, third, I think. <laughs> so this, he's pa passed his written call of fire, so this is his oral exam, um, it's on a topic that is not his research project, and he has not been helped by the committee at all, um, so we'll see how well he does. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the way this works is, from what I understand, is that the committee will hold their questions till after, so students are encouraged to ask their questions at the end of his approximately 45 minute presentation. Okay, take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Panisi. Uh, again, my name is Richard Davis, and the project that I've prepared for this oral preliminary exam is uh, reducing the burden of Burkholderia hepatia complex on cystic fibrosis. Um, and this date was supposed to be crossed out because, you know, uh, we got uh, a great deal of snow yesterday. Um, so sorry for all of you guys who had to kind of adjust your schedules, but I'm, I'm very glad that you're here. So this is basically the outline of what we'll talk about. We'll start by talking about the background and significance, some of the preliminary data, and then move into the hypothesis of the project and the three specific aims that we'll use to uh, test that hypothesis, and then talk a little bit about the conclusions. So cystic fibrosis, um, they've recently also been calling it 65 roses because uh, when children try to pronounce cystic fibrosis, they're unable to. Um, so they, they basically, they say 65 roses, so thus the, the rose in the background. Um, and they've kind of taken to that to kind of um, um, use with, with children to kind of lessen the burden of, of kind of talking about it. Um, but basically, it's the most common genetic disorder in the Caucasian population. About 1 in 2,000 people are, are diagnosed with this, this genetic disorder. Uh, it's an autosomal recessive disorder, and um, it, it decreases the, life, uh, the average life expectancy of patients down to around 35 or so. Um, basically, um, the, the causes of this are kind of outside the scope uh, of this project um, directly. But basically, there's a, a mutation that occurs in the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator, which you see here. And this uh, transmembrane regulator is involved with um, um, chloride ion release, so chloride outside and into the cell. And uh, one of the direct things that that causes in these, these lung cells <coughs> excuse me, is that it makes this, this mucin here um, dehydrated, and that kind of causes a blockage of these cilia in the, uh, these lung epithelial cells, and that kind of allows uh, pathogens like Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Staphylococcus aureus to kind of proliferate in, that, in, in the lungs. Um, so what you basically see here also is that this, this is sort of considered an a, a immunodeficiency in a way, because there's also some um, problems with these signaling mechanisms that are involved in the killing of these pathogens. Um, so a lot of the, um, this inflammation, this airway inflammation that occurs um, is directly linked to um, the kind of destruction of the, the lung, and that decreases the lung function. And so that's kind of a major concern in these CF patients. I forget that doesn't click over. Uh, so basically, one of the, the, the organism that we're going to talk about in these infections is Burkholderia sepatia complex. And this complex is made up of, of 17 different species that are very closely related to Burkholderia sepatia. Um, what you see depicted here is the, the percentage uh, of BCC positive patients as well as um, a breakdown of the, the demographics uh, of patients that are BCC positive. And you'll see that in children, uh, the, the death rate, the mortality rate is about at 30% over here for, for females and 33% for males. Um, and it's actually much higher in adults, somewhere between 60% and 75%. Um, so obviously it's a real concern, this infection is a real concern for patients with CF. Um, and there's, there's several re reasons that this is kind of the most dangerous infection in patients with cystic fibrosis. Um, the first of which is the acquisition of this causes a, a, a rapid decline in lung function, um, mostly associated with the inflammation, but also with bacterial toxins that are, are released during these infections. 20% um, of these cases re result in what's called Sepatia syndrome, which is a, uh, it's a necrotizing pneumonia uh, that can become very fatal for these patients. Uh, in addition, it's marked by a, a great deal of antibiotic resistance. There's actually a, a great deal of efflux pumps and um, natural, in, um, natural resistance that these, these cells have. 
In addition, it's also very easily transmitted among CF patients. So currently, isolation is one of the uh, mechanisms they use to try and prevent the spread of this organism. However, um, isolation does not seem to be enough. Even when these BCC-positive patients are isolated, new infections are still acquired. Um, so there's, there's a great deal of concern in, in trying to find what the reservoirs of bacteria are, where people are acquiring these infections. This is a breakdown of the, um, the, the percentages of prevalence of these different organisms. And uh, you can see actually now, this was done in 2010 um, for U.S. patients, and you can see that there's kind of been a shift now towards uh, multivorans as the, uh, the major species in these infections. However, uh, Senesipasha is very close behind at 31%, um, and then all the rest kind of fall, and these are other major members of the um, BCC complex. In addition, um, the percentage of people who are first infected with multivorans has increased over the, uh, the past uh, 10 years, whereas those infected with um, Senesipasha has kind of decreased. Um, we'll talk in a minute about um, something that kind of complicates this a bit. So in uh, um, the Manchester CF unit, they did a comparative study. So they paired off uh, patients who had Burkholderia senesipatia with patients who had Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and they paired them off based on um, similarities in age, similarities in um, antibiotic treatments, um, FEV1 values, the forced um, expectoring uh, volume and the, the forced uh, biocapacity volumes. Uh, those percentages were paired off. Um, and then they basically tested what the uh, effects uh, are. So what's the one-year survival and the five-year survival of these patients? And you can see that there's actually statistically uh, a significant difference between the five-year survival rates of Senosopasha and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And um, I should say also that Pseudomonas aeruginosa is uh, another major organism in these infections. Um, so obviously there's a significant decrease in the survival rate with Senosopasha. Whereas in multivorans, this actually, they found that they were the exact same in these organisms um, for these pairs. So obviously, Cenosopatia um, has a much higher um, association with uh, death in these patients. With that being said, we'll focus on, on two major uh, species for this project. First, we'll look at Burkholderia Cenosopatia. Um, this, this organism has a worldwide distribution because it's found in the rhizosphere of maize. And the rhizosphere is this this area around the roots of a plant where uh, a bacteria can kind of thrive because of uh, uh, relationships with the plant roots. Uh, there's two major subgroups. There's uh, 3A, which is mostly found in Europe and Canada, and then 3B um, in the United States. And um, actually, most of all the studies on Burkholderia senesipatia have been done on these 3A isolates, um, whereas these 3B actually um, represent the majority of isolates in uh, the United States. So there's obviously a real need to kind of characterize these three B strains and, and determine the similarities and differences. Um, in addition, the, the five-year survival is as low as 66.6%. Um, it's important to note that in some strains, the survival rate can get as high as 91%. So there's obviously some very, um, some, some very important differences between different strains that can determine that survival rate. And that's part of what we'll be interested in determining in this study. Uh, in addition, 7.3% of patients who um, begin with any organism other than Burkholderia senesipatia um, experience a shift in species during the um, infection. So they start out with one species and then somehow acquire and end up with a different species that has begun to thrive in that environment. Uh, and 63% of the time, it ends up being senesipatia that they shift to. Um, so even though we saw earlier that senesipatia is not usually the first organism, it's still an organism that becomes very um, prevalent. Um, so we'll also focus on the most prevalent organism now, which is multivorans. And this is a genome of R2 organism versus this 3. Um, and it's also the most prevalent species as of 2010. And as we said earlier, there's no, there doesn't seem to be much difference in survival um, versus Pseudomonas aeruginosa. What this basically shows, this map shows the um, sequence typing distribution of the strains. And the way that sequence typing works is you uh, take seven housekeeping genes. These are genes that are uh, essential for growth and division in the bacteria, or ca uh, catabolism, or, or different important aspects of the bacteria. And these don't change very often. If they do change, it may render it unable to grow and divide. So the mutation rate on the uh, housekeeping genes they use for this is very low. And because of that, you can use it to kind of determine um, uh, phylogeny of these organisms. 
So what you basically see here are the different sequence types listed uh, in different regions. And uh, you can see that ST28 is distributed almost throughout the entirety of the world. And uh, ST28, that's important because it's, it's, one, it's that strain that has that 66.6% survival rate. So it's obviously a real concern that this strain is, is pretty much everywhere. Uh, in addition, this ST32, which is also a 3A strain, um, is uh, found worldwide as well. And so there may also be, those are organisms that also have um, an association with the rhizosphere. So obviously there's a real interest in determining whether or not patients can acquire these bacteria uh, from the natural environment. Once the bacteria gets inside of the lung cells, or gets inside of the lung tissue, I should say, it's able to uh, form biofilms and also translocate through the epithelium. Um, so we're not exactly sure how this occurs. Uh, I haven't seen anywhere in the literature yet a description of how this occurs, um, but we think that it involves breaking the linkages here in these tight junctions, um, and that allows it to translocate through these, these tight junctions. In addition, the bacteria can be internalized into these epithelial cells and travel through the epithelial cells um, in endosomes and, and autophagosomes, which we'll talk about later. Um, in addition, there's, um, once it gets in, it's able to affect these macrophages, um, neutrophils, and dendritic cells. And that's important for several reasons. The, the effects on this dendritic cell tend to shut down the adaptive immune response, uh, which makes it harder for the host to, um, to opsonize and, and get rid of this bacteria. Um, in addition, necrosis of these neutrophils uh, releases these, these toxic granules into the lung. Uh, so you're releasing things like neutrophil elastase, which has been previously associated with the uh, largest um, percentage of um, lung damage. So the more elastase you see, the greater the lung damage. Um, in addition, uh, they can grow and divide inside of these macrophages, so these may also provide a, a reservoir for bacteria within the lung tissue. So one of the most interesting things and for any of these organisms that infect CF patients is that that's a very difficult environment for a bacteria to survive in. Um, first of all, it's very low in iron content, it's microaerophilic, um, it's very different in nutrients. So one of the, the major concerns in these infections is, is, is determining the ways by which the bacteria can survive in this very difficult environment. So um, there's a lot of different regulatory mechanisms that these bacteria have. And uh, that's going to be a part of what we're going to study in, in the, this proposal. Um, but the ones to kind of pay particular attention to are this microaerophilic metabolism, adaption to the nutrients in the micro in the, the lung, uh, the alteration of, of cell envelope structure, and um, these iron acquisition mechanisms. These are all ways to try and shift the, the, the physiology of the cell to survive in the lung. In addition, um, our third aim will look at uh, these antibiotic resistance mechanisms, such as uh, upregulating these drug efflux pumps. With that being said, there's three purposes to this study. First of all, we want to decrease the acquisition of new infections. And to do that, we want to look at the, um, the elements necessary for establishing infections and determine whether or not it's possible that the genetic elements are there for patients to acquire these infections from nature. Uh, in addition, we want to decrease the source of bacteria in the lung tissue. So uh, we want to determine the ways that bacteria survive and replicate in these lung epithelial cells and also associate those roles to bacterial response regulators like uh, alternative sigma factors, which we'll talk about later. Uh, we also want to develop synergistic therapies for current treatment. So how can we make current treatments like antibiotics more effective? And uh, the ways that we can do that is by determining ways to increase the potency of antibiotics by decreasing resistance and also develop molecules which block the ability of, of the bacteria to penetrate through tissue. This is sort of a, a more formal way of stating what we just did, but these are the aims of the project. Um, I won't relist them, but basically um, these, are, these are the three aims that we're going to focus on as we work. We're basically going to do a, a genomic study for aim one, a transcriptomic and biochemical study for AIM-2, and then for AIM-3, more biochemistry to determine um, mechanisms for intervention. So with that being said, we'll go into the first AIM of this study. The first AIM basically has two uh, major parts. First of all, um, extracting genomic DNA sequencing and assembling the genomic DNA um, using next-generation sequencing technology. And then um, a, a comparative study where we'll use um, comparative for these, these environmental and clinical isolates 
uh, as well as determining small nuclear polymorphisms and contrasting the, this core genome profile that we build, this core virulence profile, to Burkholderi multivorans, which is now the more prevalent organism. This is some preliminary data um, using a, a mouse model. So they basically used um, um, auger bees that had bacteria inside of them and had the, uh, the mice inhale these beads. And once these beads make it into the lungs, the bacteria is able to um, grow and replicate within the lung tissue. So um, what you see listed over here are clinical strains versus environmental strains. And um, it, they're basically measuring the percentage of mice that were able to clear the infection, which is shown in white, and then mice that were um, chronically infected, shown in gray, and mice that had uh, mortality <coughs> events, mice that died in, in black. So you can see that there's um, basically... Uh, I should also say that these stars up here represent uh, a comparison of virulence versus the control. The control that they used was J2315, and this is that organism that's that ST28 organism that has that really high mortality rate. So they're comparing everything to that ST28. Um, so you see that some are found to be have no statistical difference versus at, uh, the uh, J2315, whereas other ones do. Uh, and kind of the major trend that they found using their, um, their number crunching, using their statistics, was that these clinical strains are able to cause more mortality, uh, whereas these environmental strains are able to establish um, a greater number of chronic infections. And so there's this real kind of interesting interplay there, and that's what we want to flesh out with our genomics study. So the genomes first that we've selected will be sequenced um, and constructed, I should say sequenced, um, but they should be um, sequenced using this TrueSeq technology. This is uh, Illumina's um, sequencing technology on an Illumina High Seek 2500 sequencer. And the reason that we selected this is it has the, uh, the highest percentage and yield of data greater than a quality score 30. And basically what the quality score 30 represents is um, the point at, what, at which our inferred base call accuracy, each base call as accurate as it is, is about 99.9%. So um, because this one has the greatest accuracy, um, that's the, the device that we've chosen. Uh, in addition, we chose this device because it can do several different applications. It can do de novo sequencing, it can do RNA sequencing, it can sequence small RNAs, and it can also do a chromatin immunoprecipitation linked sequencing. Um, and we'll talk about that application later. Um, so these are the genomes that we've chosen to sequence. And this is based on that murine model. Uh, so what you basically see is uh, a distinction over here, uh, kind of a summation of the results from the other slide. Uh, whether or not they were able to cause death, whether or not they were able to cause um, these chronic infections, and whether or not they were cleared. Uh, so basically what we've done is taken this column, as well as the significance versus J2315, and constructed a, a means of comparison for all of these genomes, which is what you see here. So basically... Um, Anywhere that you see a green line and a red line, these are times that we're going to contrast the genomes of those two organisms, or at least the, uh, the, the virulence factors of those two organisms. Um, and then anytime that you see these, these two green lines, that's where we're comparing the two. Um, so basically, um, one of the ways to do this is to take the reads from strain one and map them against strain two. And uh, basically the program will give us the reads that don't match this other strain. And uh, we can take those reads uh, turn them into contigs and blast those contigs to figure out what genes are present. And uh, that will tell us some of the genes that are present in one organism and not present in the other. Um, so what we're looking at up here are clinical strains. So these are all the strains from that clinical group and then all the strains from that environmental group. And as we move more towards the center, what we're trying to, to whittle it down to is what are the mechanisms required for the establishment of those chronic infections here and what are those mechanisms for um, creating more like mortality events here? Um, and then we'll compare those two to determine kind of a, a set of key core factors uh, for these organisms. The, uh, another way that we can confirm these results is by constructing core and pan genomes. Um, a core genome basically has all of the genes that are found within all of the organisms, uh, within all the strains, I should say. So if, if that gene family is present in all of the strains, it's added to the core genome. Um, a, a pan genome is basically uh, elements that are within some of these genomes that aren't present in other genomes. So these are kind of the unique genes, um, or genes that don't have enough homology to be considered part of the core genome. So we can also use a program called MUGSY, 
And uh, this program can basically take the entirety of the genome and um, uh, compare the, the small nuclear polymorphisms present. And these small nuclear polymorphisms are just um, mutations that are, are um, seen several times in the genomes that may or may not kind of have an effect on the, the, what protein uh, amino acids are there. So uh, that's something else that we can look at, and, and once those distinctions are made, we can flesh those out further. Um, once we get this, this center uh, core factors, we can compare those with Burkholderia multiforans, ATCC17616. Uh, and this is also, this is a genome that's already been previously sequenced. Um, I guess I should also say that J2315 is a genome that has already been completed, so that's something that we can use to kind of uh, determine how well our constructions have been done. The outcomes from this first aim is that we'll build this profile of, of these core infective genes required for uh, avoiding lung clearance. And that should, um, that should be essential for informing future studies investigating any prophylactic therapies or uh, means by which to kind of prevent the acquisition of these organisms. Uh, in addition, um, some of these factors may shed light, as we've already seen in some of the previous data, uh, they may shed light on the potential understanding by which these environmental bacteria can, can be acquired, uh, which may create new guidelines for CF patients to avoid the acquisition of these new infections. With that being said, now we'll shift into the second part of the aim, which is decreasing that source of bacteria within the lung tissue, so after this infection has already occurred. In order to do that, we'll determine the expression profiles using transcriptomic analysis, um, and that basically will involve um, these bacterial factors during endosomal invasions, so how they um, are taken up by endosomes and how they travel through these uh, epithelial cells within endosomes, and also then focusing on uh, replication within this endoplasmic reticulum, which is kind of a, a unique way that this bacteria um, grows and divides inside of these epithelial cells. We'll then focus on the response regulator necessary for, up, for, for controlling the upregulation and downregulation of the genes that we identify in the first two sub-aims. Uh, and we'll utilize ChIP-seq to do that uh, and then confirm these using Miller or um, beta-galactosidase assays and biochemistry. And you see listed here um, the two response regulators that we'll focus on, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But first of all, it's important to note that some previous transcriptomes have been done, so we're not completely working from scratch here. Uh, however, the first one was done in CF-like medium, actually in a um, CF sputum, uh, with, with no actual cell culture. So um, that, that gave some preliminary information. It's also been done uh, in macrophages, what you see at right. So this should be somewhat similar to the intracellular environment of the lung epithelial cells. But uh, we, can't, we can't take that fully. We, we um, propose basically to study that further within the actual lung epithelial cells. Um, and basically you can, say, you can see that there's several upregulations and downregulations here. Um, and there's still a great deal of factors that are poorly characterized. So this just basically shows the uh, intracellular trafficking and also markers inside of, uh, of these um, cells. So once these bacteria are taken up by an early endosome, um, they somehow can avoid that endosome being fused with a lysosome. So usually what happens is that endosome is trafficked to a, a, a phagolysosome, and when those fuse, it kills the bacteria. However, in these cells, it can somehow avoid this fusion um, and instead incorporates itself into an autophagosome, which traffics it to the endoplasmic reticulum, which is where it grows and divides. So uh, there, there's a kind of an interesting, um, this is an interesting mechanism, so uh, it's not very well understood still. Um, you also see listed here some of the markers um, that we'll use Caldex in. Um, instead of EEA1, we're going to use RAB5 and RAB7, uh, and we'll explain why in a bit. Uh, this image, the study they were doing here, basically they, they mutated a type 4 secretion system um, in order to see the effects on this lysosomal, this end of the endosome trafficking and uh, determined that without this factor, it ends up in the lysosome. So there's obviously several factors important to this. In addition, uh, they've, they've previously done these tracking studies in the epithelial cells. And uh, you can see that in these IB3, which is a, a CF cell line, uh, they basically used uh, EEA1 as a marker of early endosomes, as well as a red fluorescent protein expressing bacteria. And you can see there's co-localization in the endosomes for this bacteria. Um, 
And this is against, um, this is against, I think they used RAP7 here. So this is, um, they're, they're basically, it's not in these late end zones yet at this point. In addition, they've used calnexin, um, green fluorescent protein, and uh, determined a co-localization of signal after 24 hours of this red fluorescing protein with calnexin, which indicates that it is inside of the endoplasmic reticulum. They've also shown that treatment with a drug that prevents the formation of these autophagosomes um, prevents this bacteria from getting into the endoplasmic reticulum and is associated with um, a lower CFU count from these cells. So obviously, if this doesn't occur, there's, no rep there's less replication. So basically, this is just a summation of what we just said. Vesicles fuse with these early and late endosomes and then the bacteria can prevent the endosome from fusing with lysosomes. So one of the things that this, this other study has done is they've looked at um, the effects on RAB7. Uh, so usually RAB7 uses um, a, GD, a GDP conversion to GTP in order to bind this, this factor RILP, which assists in driving it to the lysosome. So one of the things that they did is they took a, a fluorescent version of this RILP and they photobleached these cells. They eradicated the fluorescent signal. And so the only way that this fluorescent signal can be restored is if cytoplasmic RILP is recruited to that endosome. And so um, what they've basically shown is that RILP, if, there's, if these bacteria are heat killed, this restoration of signal occurs. Whereas with live cells, the restoration of signal doesn't occur um, as, as strongly. So basically somehow the bacteria is preventing RAB7 from recruiting RALP, and they, they predict that it has to do with this, this GTP, this GDP, GTP um, aspect. So um, while that's interesting, we uh, propose to use this instead to determine the, uh, the viability of the cells. So before we do our transcriptomes, we want to make sure that the, uh, the bacteria that we're focusing on or that we're isolating is enacting the correct physiology, is, is enacting the physiology we wish to study. So um, obviously, if we see these, these bright endosomes, then we know that the bacteria are not causing the effects that we want to see. Um, so basically what we will look for, um, I, I should mention, I think I did, but that RFP, that bacteria is expressing RFP, which is why it's shown in red in these figures. Um, so basically, um, the time for removal that we'll predict is two minutes, and what we're going to look for is um, cells that are low in this RILP signal but are high in this RFP bacterial signal. And those would be the ones that we will micro dissect to take further into this project. Um, so uh, if this time needs reevaluation, we can reevaluate using RAB5 and RAB7 GTP, or not GTP, GFP, I should say, excuse me. Um, so once these are micro dissected, um, we can put them in a, a solution called RNA later. And this RNA later locks down the RNA physiology, so it prevents changes in the physiology after it's out of the cells. Um, so basically, not out of the cells, but after it's out of the tissue. Uh, and then we can harvest the bacteria um, by lysing these eukaryotic cells selectively using what's called saponin-mediated lysis, which only lyses the eukaryotic cells. From there, we can um, spin down and isolate the prokaryotic cells, lyse those, collect the total RNA, and then uh, prepare those using Illumina's TrueSeq technology, uh, and then sequence those using the Illumina High seq 2500. So once we've done that for endosomes, it's then important for us to look at this endoplasmic reticulum replication. And uh, I know that this image is, is kind of fuzzy and hard to see, um, but the, well, basically the essential part of this is that we can use Wartmanin which is a drug that inhibits, it's a steroid that inhibits the PI3K, which is important for um, the creation of these autophagosomes. So if we block the autophagosomes, then we can block the ability of the bacteria to be trafficked into the endoplasmic reticulum. And so that's kind of what we want to do. If we inhibit the bacteria, we'll take these IV3 cells, treat them with Wartmanin, um, and then also have untreated cells. And we can compare the two to determine the physiology within the endoplasmic reticulum. So the extracellular bacteria will be washed off of these cells at two hours, and then uh, the intracellular bacteria will be collected in the means that we previously described after 24 hours. And then they'll be submitted to uh, sequencing as we described in the previous sub-aim. From there, once we make these distinctions, we determine what genes are upregulated and downregulated, it's important to figure out what factors are causing that upregulation and that downregulation. 
So um, one of the things that we are, are proposing as well is to perform those studies um, using ChIP-seq assay for two different um, response regulators. Uh, one of these response regulators is RPOE, which is an alternative sigma factor that's been well described in E. coli, um, but not well described yet in Burkholderia. Uh, one of the things that they know is that uh, a loss in this RPOE causes rapid trafficking of these endosomes to lysosomes. So obviously it is required for that lysosome. Uh, you see that picture here, basically this, this um, they use dextrin to image the lysosomes, and you can see a co-localization of signal here for a, a RPOE null mutant versus the, uh, the parent strain. So uh, that's obviously an interesting observation and, and something that we need to uh, study further. In addition, there's this regulator called BCAM 1871, and we're really not sure at all what this regulator does. The only thing that we really know about it is that a deletion of this regulator has significant effects on um, N-acetyl homoserine lactone, which is the molecule that's extremely important for quorum sensing, and which is the, the mechanism by which bacteria can detect um, their numbers, how populated that region is, and is involved with the expression of a lot of different virulence factors. Um, they've also shown that it has significant effects on flagellin and motility. Um, so that's another response regulator that we'll look at at this part of the study. So as I mentioned, we're going to use chromatin immunoprecipitation sequencing or CHIP sequencing in order to do that. And then um, once we have associated genes that are, are upregulated or downregulated by, this, um, respond, by these response regulators, we can confirm that using beta-galactosidase transcriptional fusions in regulator null mutants. So if we knock out those response regulators, we can then use a, a Miller assay, which will tell us the activity of those genes versus the wild type. This is uh, taken from Illumina's site, but this is their, their kind of outline for the, the protocol for their chromatin immunoprecipitation. Uh, and the way that that works is basically the proteins are bound to the DNA within the cell, and then we immunoprecipitate the, well, first we fix those proteins to the DNA um, so that they are per, they're stuck onto that DNA. Then we immunoprecipitate those proteins using um, antibodies against those proteins. Uh, so basically, the two of these fall out together in that precipitation. From there, we release that fixation, which releases the DNA, and we sequence, we, we prepare that by adding these adapters important for the sequencing device, and then um, sequence these, these um, DNA inserts. And what that gives us is basically a um, sequence data for all the places where this protein is bound. So if you already have the genome finished, you can map these, the sequence data can be mapped to the uh, genome that you've prepared, and you can figure out where this, um, this protein is binding. The outcomes basically will characterize the proteins required for senesapasha to survive and replicate in lung cells, which will inform future work into how to uh, inhibit the sources of bacteria in the lung tissue. So if you can decrease the number of bacteria um, being um, replicated, being produced in the lung tissue, then you can assist antibiotics and the host immunity in controlling this infection. In addition, you can determine the regulatory proteins necessary for that physiological switch. And the overall hope will be reducing the, the source of new bacteria, um, like I just said, to, to allow current therapy to overcome these chronic infections. And the last part of the study will be developing these synergistic therapies for current um, treatment. Uh, and there's basically two targets for that. First of all, R&D efflux pumps. These are restriction node, restriction node dependent, uh, determinant efflux pumps, excuse me. And they're used by uh, bacteria for removal of antibiotics from the cell. Uh, so basically, we'll utilize a, a photofluorescent assay that's been previously developed and confirm that using biochemistry. Um, I should say it's been previously developed uh, in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It's not at all been tested for Burkholderia senesapasha. So that's, that'll also be uh, an outcome of this project. In addition, uh, we'll focus on zinc metalloproteases, ZMBA and ZMPB. And these are um, able to cleave extracellular matrix proteins. Um, also, interestingly, they're able to cleave these alpha proteinase inhibitors, which is actually involved with down, um, decreasing the active elastase in the lung. And as I said earlier, this neutrophil elastase is one of the most um, damaging molecules in the lung tissue. So obviously, by, by inhibiting the inhibitor, sort of, um, th this, this, these metalloproteases are able to actually cause more lung damage. Um, I, I've not seen it yet in the literature, but it'd be easy to kind of predict that these may also be involved in breaking these tight junctions to penetrate further into the tissue, uh, which may have some kind of link to the Sapasha syndrome. What you see drawn here is a, 
basically a, di a diagram that compares the five different types of efflux pumps. And while we're not really focusing on these other types, it's important to note that all these are involved in pumping drugs out of the cell using some kind of motive force. Um, so these actually, these ABC superfamilies use ATP. These three use, um, use proton motive forces, and this one uses sodium. Uh, but the major one that we'll be focusing on here is this R&D family. And um, basically, that R&D family, um, as I said, pump antibiotics inside the membrane and outside the cell. Uh, they contain this inner membrane protein, which you see in green here, then a complex of these periplasmic proteins and an outer membrane channel. And obviously for these, the, the best target would be this outer membrane channel because it exists on the outside of the cell, so we don't have to worry about our drug penetrating through the bacterial cell, which is one of the major kind of natural means of resistance in these gram-negative cells. Uh, so basically, we'll hopefully be able to characterize inhibitors for this, this outside uh, outer membrane protein. In Pseudomonas aeruginosa, this, this pump is the OPRM mex AB. That's kind of one of the major pumps in Pseudomonas. And um, this, this Burkholderia area cetacepasha actually has a homologue of that, which is uh, this BCAM 0923 through, through 0925. And so that's the efflux pump that we'll focus on for this study. It's been shown to be upregulated in CF sputum when there's antibiotics present. Um, they did this via transcriptomics. In addition, a deletion of that um, efflux pump is shown to increase the, the susceptibility to antibiotics, including aminoglycosides. <coughs> this basically outlines the assay that we will utilize for this study. And the way that it works is you create this liposome that has um, a, a pH-responding uh, fluorescent dye here. This pyrenine, this pyrenine is a, um, a pH-responding dye. You see that outlined here. At high pHs, it releases a fluorescent signal, where at lower pHs, that fluorescent signal is eradicated. Uh, so basically, what you do is you place a bacterial rhodopsin um, on this, this membrane, and this is pumping uh, protons inside of this liposome. You basically then place your proton motive force driven transporter like this efflux pump um, in opposition to that. So as one is pumping protons in, the other is pumping protons out of the cell. And you basically can see a change in the fluorescent signal if this efflux pump is not functioning. So that's what we will look for in these, these assays. We'll be looking for um, basically a, uh, a fluorescence drop that indicates um, strong inhibition of this um, pumping out versus um, less inhibition, which would cause this fluorescence to, to be maintained. So once we have decided which candidates are the strongest candidates, we can further characterize those um, for dissociation constants using isothermal calorimetry. Um, and that just basically will determine the, the dissociation constants um, for, the, uh, for this inhibition, for the inhibitor binding to this efflux pump. We can also then test in vitro the synergistic effects of antibiotics in medium using these, these efflux pump inhibitors and determine kind of the, the MIC of untreated cells versus treated cells. These are just several of the candidates that have been previously outlined as R&D uh, efflux pump inhibitors. So first of all, you see this, this, uh, this peptidic backbone-based molecule they determined had activity against these EPIs. Uh, and that basically, after they've isolated this candidate, they improved the stability and made it less toxic, and uh, this is the result. In addition, you see two non-peptidic backbone-based inhibitors here. So these would obviously be three compounds that could be the start of our inhibition study. Then we'll move on to these zinc metalloproteases. These are members, uh, these are members of clan MA, family M4 metalloproteases, and what that basically means is that they're very closely related to thermolysin, um, which is a, 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 a zinc metalloprotease that enacts this mechanism that you see here. Um, basically, this zinc helps in activating water so that this water can then be used to cleave the protein. Um, and you see there's also a histidine residue and an asp uh, aspartic acid residue that's involved in this. So naturally, these, this active site motif of, of histidine, aspartic acid, histidine, is very important in this active site. Uh, there's two um, major homologs of this protein. First of all is Pseudomonas aeruginosa last B. Uh, this is the structure of last B. You can see the, the P1 prime and P2 prime binding pockets right here, and then the zinc molecule within this kind of green box. 
Uh, in addition, uh, that thermolysin um, is found in an organism called Bacillus thermoproteolyticus. And um, so obviously there's two homologs that have been previously described. So we'll basically test these, against, these inhibitors against recombinant ZMPA and ZMPB um, using um, stopped flow spectroscopy. And uh, this comes from, from Jason, my lab mate. But basically the way that this works is you're adding concentrations of inhibitor and determining the uh, production of product uh, using some kind of fluorescent product. Uh, so for these, we would use a, a, a molecule that has a quencher on one end and a fluoresce, uh, fluorophore on the other. So when this, this peptide is cleaved, it releases a fluorescent signal because it's, it's unquenched. Uh, and you track that activity versus um, time. And then from that, you can determine the kinetic parameters. You can determine michaelis menten constants and the uh, inhibition constants. And um, use that basically, well, you can determine michaelis menten I should say, as well as um, the Vmax and, and KCAT, uh, which is the, the rate constants. And then basically do a line weaver burk linearization, so take the double reciprocal of those in order to determine the inhibition constants and the, the means by which this inhibition occurs. Um, so you see just for this example, this is the uh, concentration of inhibitor here. And um, you can see that the, basically this is a mixed inhibition because it's, it's in between this X and Y axis. In addition, we can suspend these in solution and incubate them with epithelial cell monolayers to determine how these linkages um, are broken, if, if there is some kind of breaking of the, the linkages between these tight junctions. What you see listed here are several candidates um, that are inhibitors for last B. Um, they've shown that there's these two compounds here, EDTA and 110-phenylethylene, have um, activity against that, um, that metalloprotease, uh, EDTA most likely because it's chelating that, that zinc ion. Um, they've shown that this, this inhibitor, phosphoramidon, that has um, specific activity versus LAS-B does not have activity against this zinc metalloprotease. So obviously this zinc metalloprotease doesn't have the same binding site. Um, shown right here, you also see um, these three compounds that are listed here. This is the one right here that um, they determined in this study had the most activity against LAS-B. Uh, this is the inhibition constant listed here. Um, it's also important to note that because matrix metalloproteases are also um, similar metalloproteases, these, these inhibitors were shown to have no effect on matrix metalloproteases. So they're very specific for these bacterial metalloproteases. The conference okay, is about study. to end. Thank you. <laughs> this study basically will determine candidates for the ambition of R&D efflux pumps, which uh, should uh, allow antibiotics to better control these chronic infections. Um, it'll determine candidates for the inhibition of zinc metalloproteases, which should uh, decrease the penetration of lung cells and prevent, hopefully, the Sapatia syndrome. And then synergistic therapies, which can determine um, the effects in animal models. So this is just a relisting of our conclusions, but basically, um, you know, we de hopefully uh, the results of the study will decrease this uh, acquisition of new infections, the source of bacteria in lung tissue, and develop those synergistic therapies. And um, with that, I'd like to acknowledge my committee members, uh, Dr. Panizzi, Dr. Shen, Dr. Lyles, and Dr. DeRider, who all uh, had to shift their schedules a bit to, to be here, uh, as well as my graduate colleagues who've heard this presentation um, a countless number of times and, and reviewed this application a countless number of times. Uh, the pharmacy staff, Jenny Johnson, who's, who's helped set all of this up, as well as Chris Smith, and several of the people that I've had conversations with or, or uh, either in person or through email, um, Dr. Myron Lingham from Cardiff University, Dr. Benjamin Kopp, Dr. Uh, Picard, who got me kind of interested in the topic at a, a meeting in Baltimore, uh, and then my, my family and friends as well. And um, with that, I'd like to go ahead and close my talk and open up the floor for questions. <coughs> So in your AIM 3.2, you had different uh, potential drugs for inhibitors, mm -hmm. and uh, two of them, at, at least I look at things more in a chemistry aspect, sure. um, and I was saying your B and C drugs had similar functional groups, so I could see how they could work similarly, mm -hmm. but the A1, I, I'm assuming it was more, um, you had X's, so I'm assuming that's kind of like some metallic thing, but why would that one behave similarly as your um, B and C drugs? Yeah, it'll probably be easier to... Yeah, we'll go back to it. It's probably easier to... <clears throat> yeah, right there. I can see there are a lot of similar functionalities. Mm -hmm. um, so I can see where it could 
I, I guess it's Zorb, but I'm sure there's a different term for that in, uh -huh. in your world. But um, whereas A, I'm looking at, I'm like, okay, you, you've got some similarities, but why would that one be behave similarly as the other two? So if you look at it, actually, what you'll see, these X's actually just represent these these changeable functional groups. Oh, okay. So when you're kind of developing this molecule, um, you can you can um, basically take this. This is the backbone structure. Uh, or the template, and then modify these, put different um, different you know constituents there, and determine how those have activity against um, uh, whatever it is that you're trying to, to determine. Okay. Did that answer that question? Okay. Richard, I've got a question. I sure. think in uh, your second section, you're talking about how uh, steroids could possibly inhibit the, uh, like it could block this bacteria from like actually climbing through the, uh, I forget what you call it, I'm not a biologist, um, yeah, like to see how it can prevent it from, go have any studies been done on that and uh, shown any? So a, a lot of research into CF and controlling these infections has looked at, at steroids and, and different um, anti-inflammatories and things like that to try and see if they have effects. And uh, one of the most interesting things that they've determined is that even though they've, de they've shown that it does have some activity and they've done some trials and kind of said, okay, look, you should be prescribing your patients um, these steroids because they, they are not just these steroids, but anti-inflammatories because they do have effect. Um, a study that was looking into whether or not patients and, and whether or not doctors actually did that found that like less than 20% of them do it. Um, so yeah, there have been studies into whether this, those... Um, anti-inflammatory molecules have an effect. Um, for Burkholderia, I don't think that they've gotten to that point yet. I think that they just use it right now as a research tool. Um, and I, I'm i not even sure, uh, you know, I'm not really a, mostly a steroids guy, um, but I'm not sure how many of these are actually in the market either. I think there are some. Mm -hmm. In this, you're using Wartman and 